Hello, my name is David Giles and I'm the Senior Software Consultant at Hitex UK Limited. This is a short presentation on the clock and time based module and within the GTM timer module. The GTM timer block is subdivided into clusters. Each cluster contains a whole portfolio of other modules, including atoms, TIMs, and TOMs. Cluster zero contains infrastructure which is used by the other clusters and this includes the clock and time based module. The clock and time based module contains four sub modules as shown here in the red highlighting. The modules include a clock management unit, a time based unit, a digital phase lock loop and a mapping module. Before the clock and time based module can be configured, both the GTM and cluster zero needs to be enabled. This drawing here is a, a clock tree diagram uh, which shows the distribution of clocks from the clock generation unit through the clock control unit uh, down to the individual uh, peripherals and sub blocks within the silicon. The FGTM module is provided uh, with two clocks. Uh, the first is the system peripheral uh, bus clock which runs nominally at 100 megahertz and the second clock is the FGTM clock uh, which can run up to a maximum speed of 200 megahertz. The, the source clock for uh, clocking operations uh, within the GTM module is the clock generation unit, which nominally provides frequencies of 300 megahertz from the digital phase lock loop. FPLL0 is normally uh, derived from the main uh, oscillator module, which runs at either 20 or 25 megahertz and multiplies the frequencies up to 300 megahertz. In the event that there's something wrong with the digital phase lock loop, it is possible for the software to automatically switch in a backup uh, oscillator, which is provided from the EVR submodule. This is nominally 100 megahertz or so. Uh, so both the PLL0 and the F backs are provided into the clock control unit and within the clock control unit it is possible to switch between these two. The output from uh, the clock control unit is referred to as F source 0 and F source 0 then is subdivided down uh, to create the system peripheral bus clock and also the FGTM clock. Nominally the system peripheral bus is used for reading and writing of registers so the frequency at which data is written into the SFR registers is controlled by the system peripheral bus. But in terms of PWM uh, frequencies and uh, input pulse width measurement, all of those timings are derived from the GTM clock and not the system peripheral bus clock. The backup clock, uh, which is nominally 100 megahertz, is provided by the EVR unit and the uh, FPLL0 is provided from the clock generation unit. Both of these two frequencies um, are actually provided to the clock control unit and the, uh, the software is able to choose which of these two frequencies uh, is allowed to propagate through to become F source 0. In the event that there's a problem with the PLL, it is possible to switch over to the backup frequency, which is 100 megahertz. Nominally, we would run F source zero as its maximum, which is 300 megahertz. But in the event of a PLL failure, it will drop down to 100 meg using the EVR supplied F back frequency. The GTM then is provided with clocks through the GTM uh, divider. So the FGTM output frequency for the, the TC39XX family um, in nominally uh, 200 megahertz and in addition to this we also need uh, the system peripheral bus clock to provide uh, an interface to the register so the the, the frequencies um, associated with PWMs and uh, pulse width measurement are nominally derived from the GTM clock both of these clocks are enabled within the GTM module with a single bit within the clock control register for the GTM the input clock from the clock control unit is nominally 200 megahertz from the clock control unit and this frequency is distributed to each of the individual clusters. Each cluster has its own cluster clock divider. Clusters 0 to 4 have a 200 megahertz capability whilst clusters 5 through to 11 have a 100 megahertz uh, capability. There is only one clock and time based module in the GTM module and this resides in cluster 0. The clock and time based module comprises of four modules, uh, the time based unit, the clock management unit, uh, the digital phase lock loop and the mapping module. The time based unit contains 24 bit counters 
which can be captured by other modules within the GTM module itself. These provide timestamps when clocked uh, from clocks supplied by uh, the clock management unit, and these can provide angle stamps when provided by clocks from the digital phase lock loop. The clock management unit provides a series of external clocks, configurable clocks, and fixed clocks. These are fed to the other modules within the GTM module and can be used as clocks, for example, in PWM generation, pulse width measurement, and input filters. The digital phase lock loop is predominantly used for angle counting in conjunction with a tooth flywheel on an engine crank. Uh, the DPLL can multiply the tooth events to provide a higher resolution tooth uh, pulse counter. So a 60 tooth crank, uh, for example, can be multiplied up by 100 to provide 6,000 pulses per crank rotation. The digital phase lock loop pulses can be used in conjunction with a TBU module to provide a, an angle counter or angle stamp. So pulses which are provided externally uh, from a TIM module can be filtered and these pulses can then be routed uh, via the mapping module from the TIM into the digital phase lock loop, uh, which can then provide clock pulses for the time base unit. The clock management unit comprises of three sub blocks. The external clock generation unit, the EGU, uh, the configurable clock generation unit, the CFGU, and the fixed clock unit, uh, the FXU. The 200 MHz cluster zero clock is provided to the clock management unit, and this provides a source clock from which all other clocks are derived. The external clock generation unit can produce up to three outputs, which can be outputted onto a restricted list of GPIO pins. The signals are square wave and have a 50% duty cycle. It is possible to generate one additional clock with the help of the EGU unit, which is called CMU clock eight. And this is basically a clock which is derived from this external clock uh, divider here and uh, enabled from an option within the CMU clock control register. This foil shows in a bit more detail the external clock generation unit. The external clock generation unit is clocked directly from the input cluster clock. There are three external clocks, CMU, E clock naught through to E clock two. Each external clock unit has its own fractional divider, which comprises of a 24 bit numerator and a 24 bit denominator. The dividers can only be configured when the external clock is disabled via the CMU clock enable uh, register, which is shown here. The counters used in the dividers will be reset when the respective clock is disabled. The default value of the uh, outputs uh, is zero. The external clocks can be routed to IO pins by selecting the GPIO pins as an output alternate function. The CMU clock enable signal can also be used to provide a clock for the CMU clock eight signal, which is shown here. CMU clock eight is switched by CLK8 external divider of the register CMU clock control and it can switch between the CLS clock and the CMU external clock. This foil shows a little bit more detail of the configurable clock generation unit. The configurable clock generation unit is clocked directly from the cluster clock and provides an input to the global clock divider before being distributed throughout the rest of the configurable clock generation unit module. The divided clock is supplied as an enable signal called CMU global clock enable. There are eight configurable clocks, CMU clock zero through to CMU clock seven. Each of the configurable clocks are enabled or disabled by setting the appropriate bit field in the register CMU clock enable. Each external clock has its own internal divider, which comprises of a single 24 bit register. The dividers can only be configured when the external clock is disabled and the counters used in the dividers will be reset when the respective clock is disabled. Clocks six and seven, which are shown here, uh, have some additional clock selection uh, circuitry, which allows the configurable clocks to be used with the DPLL uh, signals which are identified by this sub-ink uh, 1 and sub-ink 2 notation.
As mentioned in the previous fall, the CFGU unit is supplied by a clock from the cluster zero divider. So the cluster zero clock um, comes into the configurable clock generation unit where the signal is then divided down. Contained within the clock divider circuitry is both a numerator and a denominator, which effectively allows for fractional division of the input clock. The output from the global clock divider is then provided to the rest of the clock generation module. Nominally, the numerator and the denominator are set to one, thereby yielding a, a global clock enable equal to the input cluster clock. The CMU hardware alters the contents of the global clock numerator and denominator automatically to one if the global clock numerator is specified to be less than the denominator. Uh, or one of the values is specified with a zero value. Therefore, a secure and prudent way for altering the value is to write twice to the numerator register, followed by a single write to the denominator register. Selecting an integer divider ratio provides a stable output clock without any jitter. However, selecting a fractional divide ratio will sum up an additional cycle into the generated clock enable period, thereby extending the period by one count periodically. The configurable clock dividers can only be updated if the configurable clock enables are disabled. The respective output clock needs to be turned off prior to the CMU clock divider being updated. After the divider has been set, the respective clock enable signal can be turned back on. Similarly for clock six and clock seven, which have additional settings related to the DPLL, these can only be updated first by disabling the CMU clock uh, via the enable registers, and then making the changes and then re-enabling the settings again. The dividers within the configurable clock unit are 24 bits wide, and uh, the equation uh, for the output frequency is shown here. The divider ratio is the value placed in the uh, clock count register uh, plus one with a 200 megahertz global clock enable signal and a value of seven in the respective clock count bit field. Then the divider ratio is actually eight, uh, giving a configurable clock in this example of 25 megahertz. Nominally, the configurable clocks are supplied with the clock from the global clock divider, which is this signal here. Uh, from which the uh, configurable clocks are divided down. So you can see the path from the global clock divider through into the individual divider, and then uh, the signal then appears to the right-hand side of the divider. However, for clocks uh, six and seven, it is possible uh, to select a different source for the clocks. So in addition to the option of the global clock enable, we also have the, uh, the additional clock sources from the digital phase lock loop. The digital phase lock loop uh, has two DPLLs, one uh, which is referred to as sub inc one and the other one referred to as sub inc two The fixed clock generation unit is the simplest of the three sub-modules within the, the clock management unit. The standard uh, CMU clock enable signal uh, is generally used to supply the fixed clock unit and the signal is then subdivided by fixed clock dividers. In the case of the configurable clock generation unit, the user can specify a 24-bit value for the divider. However, in the fixed clock unit, the divide ratios are predetermined. There are five fixed clock outputs, CMU fixed clock naught through to CMU fixed clock four. The clock division ratios are predetermined and are fixed and can't be altered by the user. Uh, the ratios are 1, 16, 256, 4096 and 65, 536, respectively for uh, clocks 0 through to 4. It is possible, instead of using the global clock enable signal to route through this uh, fixed clock selector uh, logic block, one of the configurable clocks. Configurable clocks 0 through to 7 are provided as a fixed a clock input selection option in addition to the global clock enable signal. So a choice of one from eight uh, options is available as shown in this table below.
The time base unit provides common time bases for the GTM module. The TBU submodule is organized into channels where the number of channels is device dependent. There are up to a maximum of four channels inside the TBU. TBU channel zero time base register is 27 bits wide and is configurable as to whether to use the lower 24 bits or the upper 24 bits. The output from that time base unit is referred to as TBU underscore TS0 or timestamp 0. The input selection range is 27 bits wide, um, but the user can select whether to use the upper or the lower 24 bits for the timestamp. TBU channels 1 and 2 don't have a 27 bit wide time base. Their time bases are 24 bits wide, and so the option to select an upper or lower time, time base is not available for, for these two channels. The two channels have some additional capability though. They have the ability to interface directly to the DPLL. The time base register of TBU channel three is 24 bits wide and it is used as a modulo counter for TBU uh, channel base three mark to get a relative angle clock um, to TBU uh, channel one or two base. The time base channel can run independently of each other and can be enabled or disabled uh, synchronously by control bits in the global TBU channel enable register. Nominally, when using um, timestamps uh, for capturing events such as uh, input capture for things like pulse width uh, measurement, then we can capture timestamps using, for example, channel zero um, or uh, channel one. The clocks are nominally provided from the clock management unit, and whenever we have uh, an input edge on a team, then a capture of uh, timestamp zero, one, or two is is performed by the team. This is very useful because it allows us to identify activities which are happening at a specific time and obviously the capture of two consecutive timestamps allows the option to do uh, to measure effectively an elapsed time. For TBU's channels 1 and 2 we have the additional option um, of capturing values from the digital phase lock loop um, and these can be interpreted as angle stamps rather than as time stamps. The time base counter counts up with each consecutive incoming clock pulse and the counter automatically uh, rolls over when it saturates. Each TBU channel can select one of the CMU configurable clock sources as an input clock and this can be uh, clocks 0 through to 7. Clocks 0 to 7 are nominally derived from the clock trees with the clusters clocks as CLS 0 clock as its source. These are synchronous clocks and are useful for generating timestamps at various events. For example, a GTM team on the input edge event can capture the current value of a time base. And so two consecutive captures of the same time base will provide a period measurement of the time elapsed between the two events. And this is very useful for measuring the period of input signals. The time base counters are TBU channel one and two count in the similar manner to channel zero uh, with each consecutive incoming clock pulse. The counter automatically rolls over when it saturates. Uh, the counter, however, is fixed at 24 bits and there's no upper or lower modes present in, uh, as there is in channel zero. Channel zero, if you remember, is 27 bits wide and you can nominally select whether it's upper or lower 24 bits. However, channel one and two of the TBU, uh, this option is not available. They're a fixed 24 bit wide. In addition to the standard input clocks, TBU channel one and channel two counters can be fed directly with DPLL data from the DPLL module. Channel one can be fed with signals direction and sub ink, and these uh, provide an up and down counting for angle micro ticks. Similarly, TBU channel 2 is fed with signals for sub ink uh, 2 and direction 2. So TBU channel 1 is fed with one set of signals from uh, one of the DPLLs and TBU channel 2 is fed with a set of signals from the second DPLL. For angle counting using DPL microticks, uh, the channel clock source bit fields is set to forward backwards counting mode 
as indicated in the red highlights. In channel zero, the counter is a fixed up counter. It's not, it can't count down. Channels one and channel two have the option of counting down. Um, and this is used with the DPLL. This file shows a GTM TIM module interfacing to uh, the clock and time based module uh, to capture both uh, time stamps and angle stamps for use in an engine management system. A crank uh, input sensor, for example, would, would pick up maybe the, the teeth on the rotating crankshaft. So in the case of a 60 tooth crank, you would get 60 pulses coming into the GTM TIM module. The TIM has an input filter on it, so we'll require clocks for the filter. These uh, will be supplied by uh, a choice of clocks from the configurable clock module. Uh, so in this case, configurable clock zero is used to provide clocks for the filtering process. The output of the filter provides effectively a filtered, uh, in this case, 60 pulses per crank rotation. And using the mapping module, we can basically route the output of the, um, of the TIM into the digital phase lock loop. Um, in this particular example, we're multiplying up the each tooth by 100 micro pulses. So one, uh, one input uh, pulse on here will generate um, effectively 100 pulses here. The DPLL has the ability to dynamically adjust itself. So during acceleration and deceleration, the DPLL actually tracks uh, what's happening and auto compensates itself so that in the event of acceleration and deceleration, we can actually maintain correct counting. Uh, the microchips are provided in this case into TBU channel one and uh, basically we end up with something which is an angle counter. So for every pulse which we get here, we'll have 100 pulses in here. So at various times uh, we can actually do a capture. So basically when uh, the TIM uh, provides a filtered edge uh, output into its uh, circuitry, if the TIM is set up correctly, we can basically capture a, a value into GPR1 inside the, the TIM from time base uh, unit term channel one, which is basically the angle counter. But similarly, we can also set up uh, another um, timestamp, which is basically a, a time dependent timestamp rather than an angle dependent timestamp. So in this particular case, CMU uh, clock zero, clock zero the, um, is, is also used as, as the filter clock. Uh, but in this case, it can also provided uh, in this case a timer tick of 100 nanoseconds so at the point where we get a crank tooth uh, occurring here we can both capture the angle and we can also capture the time at which it occurred so effectively by subtracting uh, two consecutive time stamps we can get the the time between two teeth which allows us to determine the rpm and uh, the angle stamp is useful because this can be used in conjunction with an atom to provide uh, a timed event such as a fixed duration output pulse which will occur at some point in the future so inside the atom you can set up a compare register which is for the angle and basically when you get a compare match so at a specific angle in a rotation you can have a fixed timed uh, output event such as uh, turning on uh, an ignition coil or turning on an injector uh, for example. And we can also generate a service request and uh, in the interrupt handler we would therefore be able to determine the crank sensor level uh, from the team. The team provides us with some data to allow us to, to, to check whether we're at a high or a low value for the, for the crank sensor. We can capture a, a timestamp so we know when the event occurred and we can provide an angle timestamp and all of this basically can be handled with uh, an interrupt. Time-based TBU channel three is completely different from the other uh, time-based channels. It's really a dedicated resource uh, for providing a 24-bit modulo counter. So the clock and direction signals are provided by the DPLL and is selected by the, uh, the use channel two, uh, which is this bit field. So you can basically select one of the two DPLLs. Um, so if if, for example, channel one is set up and is using angle stamps from uh, sub inc one and DR1, then basically we can use this as a reference for uh, our modulo uh, counter. So basically uh, this uh, will automatically do this, the subtraction from a reference value. And so the, uh, the register will effectively contain the, the angle from a specific uh, event at some point which occurred previously. So it provides a, a quick and easy way to, 
basically um, provide an angle reference. So thank you for your time today. That completes this part of the training. Thank you.